And uh, for our first speaker for today, uh, let me introduce you to her before we bring her in in the, our live broadcast. So our first uh, session today will be an introduction to the Open Access High Resolution Tropical Forest Data Program by Ms. Charlotte Bishop. Charlotte is a senior project manager at KSAT with over 15 years experience in remote sensing, primarily focusing on land applications and optical satellite data. She is also the project manager for the NICFI Tropical Forest Data Program, a program designed to provide open access to high resolution satellite data. Her presentation today will share how the program works, what it has achieved, and importantly, how you can start to use it. So uh, let's all give a warm welcome to Charlotte. Hello, Charlotte. Uh, welcome to the live podcast, and uh, you can uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. Fantastic. Um, it's great to be here today. So, so good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, where you, wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about the, uh, the NICFI satellite data program that's focused on tropical forests. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, what that is, but I want to start by giving a little bit of a preamble about why it came to be in the first place. Um, and also some of the different ways that you can access this data using open tools and, and also more recently some of the, uh, the cool things that we've added to the program to, to make it as uh, functional and accessible to as many people as possible. So why tropical forests? Why did this program come about? So uh, what, I've, what I've added here is some statistics. So the land sequesters 30% of annual anthropogenic emissions, and most of that is through forest capture. Um, and deforestation of tropical forests is a large source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for approximately 11% of global emissions. So really a huge amount of our um, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are coming from uh, deforestation of, of this precious tropical forest resource. And there really is no way of reaching the sustainable development goals without halting the tropical forest deforestation and increasing forest afforestation. Uh, in 2020, just as an example, the tropics lost 4.2 million hectares of primary forests, leading to carbon emissions equivalent to annual emissions of 570 million cars, which is considerably more, more cars than there are on the planet. So just, just to kind of put it into perspective, really, what a big problem this is, as I, as I know, we all, we, we're all very uh, much aware of the challenges we have with, with climate change uh, and the effect of greenhouse gases, but tropical forests play a really quite important role in helping support our planet and, um, and, not, uh, and, and therefore, of course, not contributing to global global emissions. So over the last few years, Earth Observation has been helping um, researchers, decision makers understand more about the forests. And this is this is not a new thing. Um, Landsat and other public data has been used for quite some time. Um, but in 2014, Global Forest Watch launched. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as we go through the programme, because it's really a, a very important uh, public publicly available resource that offers satellite-based data, um, as well as uh, other integration of layers from various different sources. So it's largely public uh, information layers that are then made available. And it's really the first of its kind that provided this kind of service. service. Since then, it's expanded to include near real-time forest monitoring and data on the causes of forest loss, and has incorporated hundreds of different contextual data sets. And Global Forest Watch has become uh, a symbol for some transparency, really, and accountability in the forestry sector. It frames uh, the conversations we have about forests and, and helps with the discussions we have and helps facilitate a really large number of users in terms of how they use and interact with satellite data. And this really was one of the key reasons why the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment through NICFI, and NICFI is Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative, 
funded this first ever global tropical forest program initiative to enable users to access high resolution satellite data uh, in a way that it has never before been possible in any application area. So this really was an kind of unparalleled offer that was being proposed by the Norwegian government. And how could we enable as many users as possible by removing the barriers to access that many of them face, which is largely around uh, cost of data, licenses uh, that are associated with commercial data, and then, of course, really the, the understanding and knowledge and access to the, this type of data uh, is very challenging. So this is where this, this program uh, came from. So through the investment from the Norwegian government, the contract was awarded to KSAT. Um, so KSAT are the, the prime contract holders. And just to give you a, a little note about KSAT, it's the only thing I'll say about, uh, about who we are. Um, KSAT is a is a satellite uh, value-added service provider and data distributor from uh, a comprehensive range of optical and SAR systems. We are also the world's largest ground station provider as well. So we work very closely with a range of different satellite operators um, to provide them and help support their access to space and their satellite missions as they orbit our Earth. We work very closely with partners, uh, our partners here, Planet and Airbus, and also delighted to be able to work with them on this program. So, and I'll touch on what this data is as we go through, but Planet data really does encompass the majority of the offering that's available uh, for this program, more by virtue of the, the constellation that they have. Um, and we also are, are really, pleased to be able to include historical data from Airbus all the way back to 2002. So uh, a lot of the public data that has been used traditionally is um, 10 to 30 meter or lower spatial resolution than that for such monitoring. And now we're looking at higher spatial resolution data, five meters or better, that is uh, available to help support this initiative. So before we go into more details about what the data is and what's being provided, I wanted to really touch on where we're providing this data. So this is not just selected areas in the tropical regions. This is the entire tropical region between 30 degrees north and south. So the image you see on your screen here, um, where you see um, an overlay of a map, that is uh, a country uh, or continent that is covered with this data. So it really is a vast area that's being covered um, with this mosaic data. So at most of our layers available to the largest group of users are covering this entire area every month um, at a better than five meter spatial resolution. So this is about 45 million square kilometers of, of our global tropical forests. Um, and we have really what underpins this program is the primary purpose of this data set by the Norwegian government, which is to reduce and reverse the loss of tropical forests and using that to contribute to combating climate change, conserving biodiversity, and of course, for uh, facilitating sustainable development and support towards our sustainable development goals. Um, so this really is something completely unprecedented in our commercial world of remote sensing. This is this is very new. What was being offered here uh, is quite is quite unique in terms of service offering. Um, and now we're nearly a year into the program. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share some of the impact that the program has has already had on those already using it. But just before we get to that, I wanted to show a comparison just to show really what we're talking about when, when I mention difference in spatial resolution and detail that people now have by virtue of this program. Um, traditionally, lots of people have used Landsat data, Sentinel data uh, to monitor the world's forests and, and obviously the regular cadence of, of both, of particularly Landsat and, and also Sentinel over various regions make this a, a very suitable public resource that can be used for this monitoring. And this example here from Brazil just shows an example from Landsat data at 30 meter spatial resolution with some, some overlays of, of plots of, of areas of interest. And then the red extracted areas are extracted areas that have come automatically um, as deforested areas as part of, of the algorithm that was run on this process. So in comparison to another image. 
if we look at the same area from the same time frame from planet data, we get this is the level of detail that you're able to see. So we're able to resolve the, the, the field boundaries in a way that we're not able to do with, with, uh, with Landsat data alone and therefore get more information uh, and be able to quantify the amount of deforestation in a different way. So that's not to say that, uh, that this replaces Landsat because of course the, the wide area coverage of Landsat is extremely useful and, and will remain so, and the same with Sentinel, but this provides additional validation data and also uh, helps uh, provide more robust modeling, helps in optimizing the algorithms that are provided and run on this data to analyze land use and land classifications. Um, so it, it does provide a significant advantage in terms of of the, the level of information that can be extracted from the imagery. And I'll talk a little bit more about, because of the cadence of the, the planet imagery, how we can help also reduce the amount of clouds in the imagery, which of course is a problem in tropical forest areas. But just before we get to that, uh, I wanted to talk about the impact of the program. So we have been live for nearly a year. In fact, the program uh, started just over one year ago. Um, and we have had really, a, 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 it's kind of been a whirlwind of a year, I would say. Um, we have eight and a half thousand users signed up to use the program. So this program, as I mentioned, is, is free for anyone. Um, and, and that has been intentional to ensure we can enable as many people as possible to access the data um, and from as many different, uh, different application sectors, different uh, working sectors, so media to research, even to commercial companies as well, who are supporting programs and NGOs and other groups um, in assisting with their deforestation activities. Um, so the, the program itself is covering 97 countries and we have 130 different countries registered to use the program. So obviously organizations within those countries that are using the data. And we have uh, over, in fact, well over 15.1 million tiles streamed. This was from our previous quarter. We were just waiting for this quarter's update, but I fully expect that will be uh, probably more like 25 to, to 30 million um, tile streams from Planet Explorer, which is one of the ways you can access this data. Um, and we're collecting various other statistics, such as um, user stories from data. We have some, some great ones. I will show some examples today of how people are using the data or how people are helping facilitate other users uh, through tools that are familiar to them. So essentially how, how we can enable other providers and other users the opportunity to help enable their user groups, which is a big part of this program and how we can work together to ensure as many people know about it and are able to access the data uh, and know how to use it and, and what value it has to their application. So this slide, there's quite a lot of information on here. So I'll, I'll take a little bit of time just to explain what the data is that we're talking about for this program. So you'll see the, the familiar map on the right hand side, which I, I shared towards the start. So this is just a, as a reminder of the coverage um, of these mosaics. So when we talk about mosaics, um, these visual and analysis ready mosaics, every mosaic that is provided under this program covers this entire area. So every month, um, from September 2020 until the program finishes, we will have a mosaic that covers exactly the view that you see on your screen. And likewise, uh, we have a, an archival mosaic set as well that runs from December 2015 until August 2020 in a biannual rather than monthly um, uh, cadence. Uh, but again, covering this whole region. But we also provide these data products in two different forms. So we provide the, the mosaics both in a visual form, so similar to what you're seeing on the screen, uh, an optimized visual display, fantastic for visualization and uh, visual comparison between, uh, between the base maps on, on different dates. And that's provided as a, as a standard red, green, blue natural color image at 4.77 meters per pixel. 
So this is the overall spatial resolution of the mosaic products that are available uh, to the widest group of users are at 4.77 meters versus the 10 meter plus that had been used traditionally through the public sources. We then also have the analysis, analysis ready surface reflectance mosaics. So these mosaics have been optimized for scientific analysis. They've been uh, normalized. They've been uh, configured to work very closely with Landsat and Sentinel data so that they can be used in conjunction with those data sets. And therefore, in the hope that this data could be plug plugged into existing uh, workflows uh, without with with limited uh, amendment needed to to suit this data, uh, but of course provide what we hope is additional advantage and detail to the analyses that you're undertaking. This data is the same 4.77 meter spatial resolution provided in four spectral bands and with the full dynamic range. So you have full uh, control over the, the feature extraction and the analysis that you might do with this data versus the visual mosaic, which is, is, uh, is, yeah, is more like a composite product in comparison. And I, I haven't touched on this, but this is an important point. We have different access levels to this data. And I just wanted to explain a little bit about what, what we mean by that and, and how, how the access varies for the different groups of users. So for those accessing the data at level zero, they likely don't realize that they're doing so. So level zero is our most open. There is no license. It is a view only data that you will find in Global Forest Watch or MAP BMS, or also through uh, the UN FAO SAPAL uh, or Collect Earth Online tools. If you're just viewing the data, um, it is a, in a level zero mode in that case. And that is just the visual mosaic product. And I should mention that both the visual mosaic product and the analysis ready, they are provided at the same time um, for that whole area. So in, in every case, you will have the option of, of either of those. You don't have to make a choice as, as part of, of signing up to the program. Uh, for the level one, this is our core level for users. So where I mentioned we have eight and a half thousand users, they are at this level one level. So the data, I, uh, the data products I just, dis just discussed, they are the level one products that are available. Um, so that gives you both of the, the visual and the analysis ready. It's a non-commercial license, but we don't want to preclude commercial companies from using the data. So there are some specific clauses. We have put some examples in our documentation that show uh, how commercial companies can still make benefit from using, um, using this satellite data and particularly in support of, of companies or NGOs or other groups that are uh, working towards the pursuit of deforestation goals. And with that data at that level, um, and I'll mention towards the end where you can sign up to have that access, um, you will have the ability to download, stream and make your own derived products. Um, so that is, uh, you know, and this is all free. I will uh, reiterate that is completely free. You can sign up at, um, at our website to, to have that access and explore the data uh, and the various other integrations that go with it. And I've added some examples on the right hand side of some of the some of the different or types of organizations that are already accessing the data. Uh, so we have media groups there. We have research. We have private companies um, and governments in different countries as well who are accessing the data. So there really is a very broad range and we don't want to limit anyone's access. Um, uh, so the, the whole point of this program is to enable as many users as possible. So, um, you know, if, if you don't see yourself represented or you're not quite sure, I can also uh, provide more data, uh, more information later in the presentation, which will show where you can ask some more questions about this. And then we have a level two, which I'm not going to focus on today. Um, and that's because this is a very limited number of users. We are talking tens of users versus the thousands that we, we see in level one and, of course, the public access at level zero. Um, so this is this is different. This is a, a ministry led assignment of level two access, which provides access to the planet uh, underlying images as well as selective 
uh, selected Airbus archive. So that's where the Airbus archive comes is part of the level two. Um, so that is much more limited, I'm afraid. So, so the focus really of much of our outreach is on level one because that is our most used uh, level of this program. And we hope will facilitate really the majority of users to, to do what they would like to do with it. We also have some outreach partners. So I will mention later, we have a very exciting RFP with Microsoft at the moment. Uh, I could also delighted to share the recent update about the availability of the level one data in Google Earth Engine. And we've also been working with Mapbox and Esri and many others as well. Uh, so just to give you a flavor of, uh, of the breadth of this program. And just uh, kind of at that, the, the second part, I guess, of my presentation, I wanted to just focus on some of the user stories that we have, have already seen come through. So I've just got three or four just to show some very small examples of, of how people are already using the data. Uh, this was, in fact, one of our very first uh, public um, case examples that we received. This was from the Amazon Conservation Group, where they were using the tools within Glo uh, Global Forest Watch to look at changes over this area in the Chiribiquite National Park in Peru uh, and using the monthly data to help quantify and map the extent of deforestation. So the image you see on the top is from October 2020 and the image you see on the bottom is from November 2020 and you can see a clear area of forest that has been cleared during that time. So this data allowed them uh, to monitor the different areas of conservation that are of interest to, to them and their group and be able to, to more accurately identify where some of that deforestation is happening and to what level in comparison with the other tools within Global Forest Watch, such as the GLAD alerts. As we move on, we have um, a really nice example from the Central African Forest Initiative. So six images on uh, on the right hand side. I'm sorry, the, the dates have, have uh, slipped a little bit, but it, but it runs from uh, from 2018 up to 2020. So using the biannual analysis and then to the, the monthly data um, and the the CAFI group is bringing together six of the Congo Basin countries to to work um, on a forest initiative and a forest activity that helps them understand more about the forest and also helps them find the tools to monitor and make changes uh, to how they manage the forest. So they're using the, the satellite data to detect and classify these changes and, and what's causing these changes to allow them to, uh, to then review those and take action where is necessary. We then have also been working with platform providers, so providers, different companies that have their own platforms that serve their own user groups who wanted to include uh, the NICFI satellite data within this. Within the, the bounds of the license, uh, this, is, this is absolutely encouraged. Um, if you have a platform, there are ways that this can be done, and we're very happy to talk about that with you. So SkyTruth is one of those examples where they have added the NICV satellite data into their data stream along with the other public data sources that they use, such as um, uh, Planet and, oh, I'm sorry about the typo on that slide, uh, uh, such as uh, Sentinel and Landsat. And their alerts tool, which they have, allows users to easily compare two, two different images and map those changes. They can be two of the same type of images. They can combine the Sentinel with the planet, for example, and, and help to validate those changes and also integrate with other data. And this is really useful for people who are used to using certain platforms. And for them, it's quite cumbersome to download data or do analysis in another tool that is less familiar to them. And finally, um, an example from Collect Earth Online and through the Geodash tool that they have already that's been running for, for some time. So Geodash is, is, uh, allows users to confirm a verified degradation. And what they do is, is use, a, use the Landsat and Sentinel archives and uh, spectral indices to, uh, to, to look at the different changes along with the imagery um, that is used to make those uh, indices and the the time series that's generated. So what the, the NICV level one data is used in this case is to help validate the changes observed in this lower spatial resolution data. So it's adding some extra value to, to the resource that, that Geodash provides. 
And then just a, a short note on, on different ways that people can access this data. Uh, I'll put on the final slide where you can, uh, where you go to sign up. So it's planet.com slash NICFEE is where you sign up for the program. Uh, on the left-hand side is Planet Space Maps Viewer, which includes all of the NICFI data sets. So you can select whether it's visual or analytic, and you can download the data at level one um, to your own platform. We also have uh, streaming possible versus Python and API integration, of course. Um, and through Planet's Explorer plugin in QGIS and ArcGIS, you can also um, have the same access to the level one data in those tools as well. Just two weeks ago, we also launched the, um, finally launched, we've been very excited about this for some time, uh, the Google Earth integration. So you will now find all of the mosaics within hosted within Google Earth Engine. So anyone who is a level one user who also has a Google Earth Engine account, we can link those two together and you will have access to uh, Google Earth, uh, to the data within Google Earth Engine, which we know for many users who are processing large volumes of data, this is really valuable. So we, we really look forward, this only launched two weeks ago. So we're really looking forward to seeing the benefit that this integration provides. And as we're talking about integration and just, just before wrapping up, um, we have, uh, we're have we really pleased to be able to launch as part of Phosphor-G this week uh, a request for proposals in collaboration with GEO um, and also with Microsoft that will uh, provide NICV data through um, Microsoft's planetary computer. So the request for proposals opened on Monday. It runs for two months. Um, you can find more information at the link on the screen at earthobservations.org. Um, and the winners of that program will receive um, funding um, from Microsoft in this case, storage of, uh, of the data uh, and, and yeah, various technical support from Microsoft as well. And you can find some more specific details about it. But from a from a NICFI project team perspective, uh, it's great to be able to have um, the, this NICFI data also available within Planetary Computer and support the great work that, that Microsoft are doing uh, and the outreach that they're doing with that tool. So I, I wanted to end on uh, on a final slide that that shows where you can sign up, a reminder of where you can sign up. We also have a range of user resources, which you can actually find also linked from the sign up page. Uh, those resources are available in five different languages, including English, um, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, we also have various other tools, depending on the level uh, of knowledge you have of satellite data to help you um, and, and also help you understand the processing that's been applied to the satellite data. And importantly, we also have a 24 seven help desk. So if there are any questions that you have about how to use the satellite data um, uh, for the NICFI program or where to go or any questions on how to use it, general information about the program, uh, we have a help desk there who are really happy to help um, with any questions that you have. Um, so I do urge you to, to reach out if, if you're having any problems, uh, we'd be really glad to help. But I think with that, I will say thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Charlotte, for this uh, really great presentation about this you know, uh, program, which uh, we've heard so many people in the Earth observation community say that you know, this is really a game changer in terms of providing the, the availability of this you know, uh, temporal and spatial resolution of data. Um, and just, you know, in the interest of time, we, we do have to transition over to Brian in a few minutes, but uh, in the two minutes that we have left, we have three questions for you. And okay. so their first see question- if we can get was, through them. <laughs> awesome. Uh, could you provide a little bit more details in terms of the Airbus data that you mentioned that will go back to 2002? And then related to that one, um, there was another question, I believe from uh, Professor uh, Wu from, from University of Tennessee. It was about if you could also tell us a little bit more about the duration of the program. And then lastly, uh, somebody had a technical question about whether or not the mosaics cover just forested areas or really it's all of that domain that you showed. So uh, take it away. Great questions. OK, I, I'll try and remember. The, or I'll start with the last one because that's a fresh one in my mind. Um, so, yes, basically the, the image that I showed, all of the countries in the image that I showed, um, 
where you could see there was an image, they are all covered. Um, so the, the predominantly that is all tropical forest countries. Um, of course, some some countries that that are within 30 degrees north and south, you may have seen that are grayed out. For example, Australia, um, because that's um, and the reason for that is that the the premise behind the program has been to really focus on those less economically developed countries uh, where this type of data would be of a greater benefit than perhaps in, in other countries, which also in the case of Australia and other regions have large areas of, of desert as well as forest. So trying to focus more directly on the tropical forest areas. In terms of duration of the program, uh, that's my fault, I should have mentioned it. It is a, a the initial uh, length of the program is for two years, but with the likely extension for four years in, in total. So we are expecting the end of the program to be 2024. Um, and the last question was about Airbus data. Uh, so yes, so, so this is selected Airbus data is made available to the level two users, and that is spot five data back to, uh, to 2002, and also selected spot six and seven images at uh, the multi-spectral resolution, so the six meter resolution um, between 2012 and 2015, essentially filling the gap between spot five and the planet scope um, uh, availability. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. Um, uh, again, you know, really great presentation, and we encourage everybody attending Force 4G to, uh, you know, to see the links that Charlotte provided. And in, in the interest of time, I will pass the mic back to uh, Francis. So thank Thanks you both. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charlotte and Emil.